Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. Uh, we're going to be talking about patriarchy, something that's you know not hot buttony at all, uh, but the family, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, children, the church, a lot of the assumptions that we have within the church, the body of Christ, um, even women working in and outside the home, what that looks like, first, second, and third wave feminism, and all the rest. Guest today is Jared Longshore, and he's a husband and a father. Uh, he's also a pastor as well. So this is a really good conversation. I hope you find it edifying and helpful. All right. Jared Longshore, Dr. Longshore, how are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having me. Good. Yeah. No. Thank you for being here. Uh, returning guest. Returning guest. Thanks for coming again. Um, briefly, just tell us who you are. I know you were in the SBC and you kind of made a transition. Popular word these days. A couple years ago, uh, you were part of Founders there and people might know you that mm -hmm. way. Uh, somebody else is curious. We did a bigger conversation on, on that and your beliefs from uh, credo baptism versus um, pedo baptism and, and kind of some transitional stuff from more Baptist to a uh, Presbyterian polity and things. Uh, but just fill us in on who you are briefly and uh, we'll get into the subject. Yeah. So, um, yes, Jerry Longshore. I'm married to my dear wife, Heather, with seven children. I'm associate pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. I'm also a lecturer in theology at New St. Andrews College, and we'll be uh, starting to serve as the dean there, actually, um, in just a couple months. Um, yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much me. As you mentioned, I used to be uh, more involved in the SBC and with Founders Ministries and um, still enjoy hearing about what's going on over over in that world as uh, you know, <laughs> who, who can take their eyes, world. Who can take their eyes off of, of what's going on there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it's definitely something that uh, you mentioned backstage, the crazy circus that's kind of a distant family relative reunion. Uh, and that's that's a good uh, good way to put the SBC for sure. Um, so, yeah, if anybody's curious about Jared's testimony, kind of moving from Baptist to Presbyterian, uh, check out. I'll put that link in the description of our conversation there. On to the subject. Um, patriarchy. Right. That's that's all the rage. People hate it. People love it. Uh, kind of folds in with Christian nationalism or uh, Calvinism, reform theology or just evangelicalism. Um, people looking at all sorts of different ways to express what the family should be, what we think the Bible says. And I mean, the trick is all of us have the Bible. I mean, even the most I mean, everybody has it right. Whether we actually adhere to the, the correct hermeneutic and understanding it is a different story. But progressive Christians, red letter Christians, liberal Christians, right, to conservative, evangelical, fundamentalist, whatever. Um, people have a different understanding of wives submit to your husband, right, as unto the Lord, uh, and what it means for the husband to lead his family in, in submission within even the triune Godhead and things like that. Uh, one thing that spurned my reaching out to you again and, and wanting to talk more is, of course, your experience, uh, which we'll talk about later on. You wrote a book about that. And uh, other things. You've got seven kids. That's amazing. Great. Good job. Um, more than, you know, the average of what 1.5 or 1.8 or whatever it is. <laughs> I don't know how you have 0.8 of a child, but you know, uh, but I was on Twitter a while back uh, and I posted, reposted a umbrella graphic. And I think we'll just pull it up here just kind of for reference for everybody and look at it to see, because it's something that to me, it made sense. And it was biblical. Uh, and it's Bill Gothard, if people know who he is, uh, and truly really to see, well, is this biblical? Is this not biblical? And what that really means. Uh, so here it is here. So it's got basically Christ is the big umbrella, then the husband's below that, which then below that's protect family, provide for family, below that's wife, and then below her is children managers of the home, et cetera. This is from an article six years ago. It's it's anti-Bill Gothard, that whole thing. We're not going to talk too much about him. I know he's been on some, I guess was, I don't know, fell, fell from grace to famed, whatever, uh, cultish type behavior, the Duggars and that whole family with what, 19 kids in County, I think it was one. They're, you know, they were part of that in a super conservative fundamentalist way. But I guess right off the bat, uh, Jared, what, like, is this, bad i mean this this christ i mean 
you look at this, I retweeted this from someone else. It was a slightly different version, but it got a lot of hubbub. A lot of people, a lot of Christians were frankly really upset about it. And it was like, I'm, wait, what? <laughs> you know, Bill Gothard, oh, he's, he's bad. He's a sex offender. He's this, he was accused of that. So what are your thoughts, initial thoughts just on this graphic alone? Yeah. Well, maybe a word about what you were saying earlier, the way you set it up. And then I'll, then a word about the graphic. You, you mentioned the wife submit to your husbands and authority in the home and the uh, tension that exists in the broad evangelical world, at least between um, an understanding of headship in the home and then uh, kind of a, a an egalitarian spirit um, where, mm -hmm. you know, the wife doesn't need to submit to her husband. The husband needs to submit to his wife just as much as she submits to her husband. Yeah. I, um, I think all of your conservative evangelicals are going to come down on this side of um, there's a head of the home. This is the Bible's really clear on this. If you're going to read the Bible and take the Bible seriously, you, you can't really buy into the egalitarianism that is mm -hmm. present in the broad evangelical world. But even when you get to um, what some call the complementarian side, you know, some people that break this down, complementarianism and egalitarianism, um, but the complementarian world starts to get soft. You have soft and hard complementarianism. You have all sorts of stuff going on there. So uh, new words are thrown around. Patriarchy, uh, headship, all of that to signal what's going on here. There is um, the, the reason there's tension is because it's, a, it's the kind of thing that warrants tension. It's the kind of thing that um, everyone knows that abuse happens that people in positions of authority abuse it if you read the bible carefully you will discover things like king saul trying to pin his son to the wall with a spear so um you come and say yeah, you know not a great move not you know not not, good, not recommended yeah, yeah. not following yeah. the graphic actually you know not exactly protecting the the child underneath i think jonathan got rained on that day um right but you <laughs> But what, how are you going to solve that problem? You're going to remove the, are you going to say that hierarchy is wrong and that that's the real problem? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is what the egalitarians claim. They would say um, that this principle of submission uh, it, of wives submitting to their husbands, that is something that comes after the fall, that it wasn't existing before the fall of uh, those who hold to the conservative, biblical, complementarian, patriarchal kind of uh, position are going to say, no, there was there was hierarchy before the fall. Um, and you can mm -hmm. cite several texts there to support this idea, Adam being created first. Of course, that's cited later by the Apostle Paul as having relevance for how we think about uh, male-female relationships, husband-wife relationships. So um, you don't solve the problem of uh, abusive authorities by denying or trying to pretend like authorities don't exist. There's just hierarchy uh -huh. is the way that the world exists. You see these hierarchies uh, not only in the home, but in the state as well. You see it in the church. You see it in the struct very structure of the world that God has created. Um, and you're not going to actually alleviate any kind of abuse by getting rid of the hierarchy. So that's a little bit, just maybe kind of laying the groundwork for the conversation. Yeah. The particular graphic is interesting to me. Um, one, it's interesting that it's raining. You know, I said, what yeah. do you do? What do you do on <laughs> days when it's sunny? Like, does that does yeah. your, do you still have your, you know? And I'm, um, I'm actually, I actually do have a point there. I think there's kind of a structure of like, uh, well, it's just that we protect it. Of course, you have provide included in the graphic. Um, protection mm -hmm. and provision all are hallmarks of what he, husbands are to do. Um, but I, you also want to add into the graphic this idea of dominion that we're not we're not just kind of protecting from rainy days we're actually building something constructing something um these children uh, under the the wife at least in the graphic there are going to be grow up to be wives and husbands themselves this kind of thing is moving somewhere and there's a yeah. there's a productivity um to god's design that um, if you get if you get the family right, you don't just keep the rain off. If you get the family right, you actually start to see a fruitful garden. And mm. the proof's kind of in the pudding. You know, you don't have to just be like really defensive and 
uh, oh my goodness, our, our relationships have gone to pot, you know, we're in such trouble. Christians can kind of, mm-hmm. conservative Christians can get that kind of mentality. And I won't always say, hey, there's, there's, um, there's something beautiful uh, uh, and good about the Christian understanding of the family. And it's not mm-hmm. just um, about, let me kind of pull down the shades and keep the, keep the bad guys at bay. Um, so that's one thing that pops in my mind when I look at the, um, the, um, the depiction there. The other is a little bit more intricate and it's kind of related to my book. So I, I recently published a book with Canon Press called The Case for the Christian Family. And the subtitle of that book is uh, The Rise and Triumph, not The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The uh, subtitle is, um, <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a much better book. That book was by Carl Truman. That's, that's another book. book. <laughs> um, the subtitle is The Covenantal Solution for the Dissolving American Family. Um, and so I, I would nitpick the... Um, the graphic there by saying it's missing something about the organic relationship between the husband and the wife and the children. So Mm -hmm. you have these various umbrellas and you, you know, okay, you have the pole of of the umbrella that's, that's connecting them, but there's, there's more of an organic picture in scripture. The husband is the head of the wife. The wife is his body, you know, and that doesn't come across. And there's something there's something to that, that when God joins man and woman together, he creates one new thing. Um, And I would emphasize covenant marriage. And if you don't grasp that that covenant marriage, that glorious union, I dare say magical union, this 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 um, union that did not exist before a certain moment in time and does exist after that moment in time where God himself actually joined together and what God has joined together. Let man not put asunder. Let man not separate this uh, because it is divinely joined. God says um, to Israel in Malachi chapter two, um, that I was witness between you and the wife of your youth. I was witness between you men. And these men were, were treating their wives terribly and they were going off and marrying other women, not only other women, but um, pagan women, women who were outside of God's covenant. And he says, I was witness. I was there. And, and, and God, it was, it isn't just a witness in that, um, that ceremony, that marriage, the way that uh, your friends and your family witness it. Those are important witnesses, mm-hmm. too. But what God's saying is, I actually was the one who joined you. I was witness between you. Um, I, I made this union. And there's something potent in that truth that does hedge against abuse of authority. Mm. That's the point. Yeah. And if you yeah, find, no, I can, I can. Yeah. If no, you find ahead. conservative evangelicals that get the that get the I'm I'm the head um, and 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 wives submit to your husbands and children obey your parents in the Lord if they get that but they don't get something about this um, this covenantal union this marriage this joining this divine um, action of God that brings about this new entity that is one new thing it's actually one new thing uh, the two are made one flesh there's a there's a real mm-hmm. oneness if that's lost, and um, then you then you're going to end up with trouble in this hierarchical um, design. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just for reference, I'll pull up Ephesians five, um, right twenty verse five twenty through well thirty three, I guess. But give thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So right there, there's already this understanding of reverence for Christ. And then obviously, there's no verse breaks in the originals, blah, blah, blah. And then right after that, wives submit to your own husbands. So it's the same word there, as to the Lord. So you're ultimately submitting to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, his body, as in, as and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands and then they stop there right a lot of times you know the egalitarians they stop there and freak out and and uh, submit to everybody we should and we just said in verse 21 we everybody just submit so whatever as if husbands don't have an equal or taller task with husbands love their wives love your wives as christ loved the church Uh, that's kind of a big deal and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her cleansing water 
washing the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies goes on and so uh, i mean that's what that's what's so frustrating at least in my perspective as a husband as a father as a pastor um and trying to pay attention to these things and you hear these arguments so many of the arguments are just you know take take a few verses and run with it whether it's pro or con it's this for that and it's like uh yeah but what's the overall context what's he why is he writing that what 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 is paul meaning or what is john or whoever's writing what does he mean um in the overall not just this one verse translated into 21st century language and see patriarchy that's bad and it's like well what's the alternative we're all equal yes we're all equal we're all made in god's image but that's not the debate here it's like you said hierarchy and patriarchy and things these things everything's hierarchical everybody has a boss everybody has someone above them and someone below them everybody even if you're a single person working at mcdonald's well you still have a boss unless you're the boss but then you have somebody else unless you're the ceo but you still have shareholders or whatever like there's still you know all the way up um yeah, yeah, you don't have to live long in the world to realize that this is God's design. And um, at least in, in some circles, you get you, you get people that are um, kind of busy going toe to toe with egalitarians mm -hmm. rather than actually teaching and starting to embody what 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 it means to live according to the Bible, of course, which is a hierarchical design, which means husbands love your wives and wives uh, respect and submit to your husbands. So once you establish that, hey, this idea of patriarchy, or if you want to call it complementarianism, um, this idea of the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, is simply biblical. You would hope that kind of you settle that quickly. So settle that quickly in Sunday school when, when they're tiny. Um, settle that quickly in the home. The, this is just the world that we're living in. The egalitarians are, are, are living in a false world. It's not, the, it's not the real world. Then you can start to get down to what, what those obligations are. Um, how does a husband really sacrificially love his wife as the head? That This is what authority does. Jesus says, uh, remember that the Gentiles who have authority, they lord it over those under their authority and um, don't do that. But I'm telling you to, you, you lay down your life uh, and Christ mm -hmm. gives us that example. So this is what the head does in God's economy is he sacrifices himself and lays down his life. And how are you going to do that? Well, you do that as a little Christ. You do that um, thinking prophet, priest, and king. Um, this is another mm -hmm. this is another point that sometimes sparks up controversy of saying, is is the husband, does the husband have like a prophetic and a priestly and a kingly role in the home, one that's distinct from the wife? And I answer that question, yes. Um, I do think that um, Scripture speaks of God's people as prophets, priests, and kings. So, uh, Every one of us in, in an individual sense are that the, the wife is that. But in the home, because he's the head, there is this particular function that goes on that is not Christ himself. Christ, of course, is the ultimate uh, prophet, priest and king. And um, he is so for all of his people. But in the home, the husband needs to think of these categories. It's going to help him to say, what does it really mean to love my wife? Well, mm -hmm. you need to be speaking. The prophet speaks, speak the truth, speak the truth to your home, to your wife, to your children um, in in. Yeah. Um, you know, let your words be like apples of gold in settings of silver. Let them be a, let them be timely uh, words. And then the wife, you know, she's also there. Um, the children need to listen to her law. So she has this prophetic function. Proverbs says, listen to your mother's law. Um, or um, speaking of the teaching of kindness that is on her tongue. The, the teach, so you have this prophetic function that you're thinking through, that you're operating in, in the home. Um, mm -hmm. Priestly. What do you do? Well, you intercede for your home. Job did this. He offered sacrifices for his children. So they, they may have sinned. And so there he is. And it, when you really model that, the egalitarians are kind of quiet. Um, <laughs> they, you know, they, you're going to still have some, you know, with like flaming pink hair that are upset at you. But, you know, most people, yeah. you know, even people that kind of aren't really happy with your use of patriarchy and such. And you're like, well, what we're talking about is like, I'm the, I, I pray for my, my family. I pray for my wife and my children. They're going to um, they're going to start backing down. But do you really embody that? Are you sacrificing yourself? Priests pray. A priest also sacrifice. So yeah. there's dad doing the hardest thing, like the thing that nobody wanted to do. Dad does it as the head. Uh, nobody wanted to go to Calvary. 
Christ goes to Calvary. And he does so willingly of his own accord, lays down his life. And there's dad doing that. And then you just have this home where the wife, all of this stuff, you know, goes out the window because the wife sees it. She sees the proofs in the pudding of this man doing what Christ has done. And the whole Betty Friedan and uh, feminine mystique of second wave feminism. Oh, you're just going to let him, you know, you just want to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, uh, which isn't a terribly bad thing, by the way. But nevertheless, that's all you want to, that's all you want to do. You want to have him walk all over you. And the ladies go, well, I, I, uh, I know that's ridiculous what this whole second wave feminism is trying to do because I watched this man who is my head sacrifice himself routinely for the mm-hmm. wealth, for my welfare and for the welfare of my family. Uh, Kingly, this is the third, right? Yeah. These three offices. Um, well, he's governing and he's ruling at home well. So when it's time for discipline, he's, he's administering that discipline to the children um, appropriately, um, wisely, and doing all of that again, kind of in covenant love. Um, and he's making wise decisions, seeking counsel. Um, he's easy to approach in the home. He listens to his wife when she comes with her thoughts and ideas. He seeks those out. He's doing this kind of kingly thing. Um, that You're actually getting down to the bread and butter of what it means to live it. And that's the best, that's the best offense against the egalitarian assault is actually just mm-hmm. doing like, you know, if you do egalitarianism, things don't go well. Mm. If you if you do um, this hierarchical approach, if you do what the Bible says about headship, but you actually have to do what the Bible says. You can't do you can't do the um, you know you can't do the fleshly approach to the hierarchical design. If you do that, things go mm-hmm. really bad. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating because I got two things. One, um, well, it's funny that. You know, a lot of times, even Christian women, it's like, well, I, I'm not going to submit to my husband. You know, I'm equal. You know, the most feminine thing to do is act like a man. Go get a job. Go do this. Provide as well. Yeah, sure. I love my husband. And yeah, we are, we're unified. Blah, blah, blah. I love Jesus. That whole thing. But I, I still need to work. I still need to do stuff because I can't possibly just be at home raising children. I can't possibly build a a family here and a structure here. I need somebody else to raise my children out there and I need to go out here and I'm going to submit to another man or woman. And, but that's different. Like, it's just, it's like, well, you don't want to submit to your husband who you're in covenant union with your one flesh that you say you love. You've made a oh, divorce is bad. Okay. Yeah, I'm never going to go out. Never going to commit adultery, but you still feel now sure. Financially, sometimes it happens and the dollar is 90% of what it once was 50, 60 years ago. Right. The U.S. dollar is junk, right? We know that. And some people lose jobs and education. There's certain circumstances that happens. Uh, but when that's your goal to be basically masculine in, in, in trying to be feminine, it's like, so you're going to submit to this guy over here as your boss, this other man or woman, when you don't want to submit to this man that God gave you to be your husband, to actually look over, like you just said, and protect, pray for, intercede, sacrifice, uh, it's, it's, if you kind of back up, I don't think most people, they kind of just get swept up, but what are you, what are your thoughts? Like why, why do people, families, you know, suburbia, Christian, you know, not huge megaplex metroplex cities or rural, but kind of in between those where a lot of people live and it's just normal. And I know we know lots of families like that and I don't want to disparage them or, oh, you're, you're, you're in constant rebellion and sin. I mean, as far as I know, maybe they are, I don't know, but, um, why do people just kind of swallow this hook, line and sinker and the husband and the wife are like, well, this is what we do. Why? What's your experience, your thought theologically or just practically something like that happens. So (laughs) a question like the one you just posed (laughs) was posed earlier this week and somebody chuckled and recounted what, um, his father used to say. And the answer, he's like, the answer is sin. Sin, sin, mm. sin. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why we act that way. Yeah. Um, little Sunday school answer. And Jesus, of course, is the solution. Um, right. But why Why are we that way? Well, my goodness, look at the culture around us. You know, we, we want to become like the culture around us. And we are dealing with, uh, you know, we are way downstream. So first, second, and third wave feminism is really interesting. And um, I can't remember the name of the book. I think Would you say we're in fourth wave, by the way? Would you say there's like a fourth wave now that we don't? Even know uh, I don't know. I kind of. I mean, I, I I haven't thought about it much, but I would say we're still in the third wave. That's the way I think. Okay. Um, gotcha. 
So, and I think Kostenberger might have a really good book where he details the three the three waves. But um, oh, investment guy not, is that Andres, right? Yeah, I think it might be Andres Kostenberger. But uh, yeah. first first wave, 1920s, uh, women's suffrage, all of that, women getting the right to vote. You have these really interesting, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I think is her name. And she mm-hmm. um, she basically said, the Dar- we got to go with Darwin. Be- and we have to... Um, we have to get rid of this fall idea in the Bible because, you know, mm. we, we need to exonerate the snake, emancipate the woman. And that's the only way we're going to get to some kind of equality. Um, and so it's really interesting that the, that first wave is, is a thing to keep your eye on. Then the second wave, 1960s, um, and um, all of this movement to get um, women in the workplace, women in the workforce. Mm-hmm. And you think, I mean, that's a that's a big cultural phenomenon in the American mm-hmm. experience. And we are now, what is that, 60 years pu- after that way of thinking. So mm-hmm. our economic life and our social life and our customs and our traditions, at least over the last 60 years, have been greatly shaped. Our minds are greatly shaped by that spirit of the age. Third wave feminism, which I kind of I'd say that we're in now is where this um, the women's movement kind of tethered itself to some of the LGBT stuff. Um, but now you have massive problems, right, with uh, transgenderism. What does transgenderism do for women's rights? I mean, you just get all kinds of those things are at odds. Um, and Truman points that out in his book, Rise and Triumph. Modern version of that is Strange New World. Uh, he, uh, he wrote mm-hmm. uh, not a modern version, but an abbreviated um, kind of a layman's layman's version, and he points out this problem with with um, transgenderism and all of the other um, letters in that alphabet soup movement. Yeah. If you go, okay, that's a big deal. Those are big cultural currents, big ideological currents that are shaping the way that the Christians think today. And mm-hmm. you have to unwind all of that, and um, that gets weird. And that's the job of pastors to actually go back and say, okay. Here's here's some truths, um, and there's been lies that have been told. I, so I, I mentioned um, how the second wave feminism did this. It it played, um, it, it it basically shamed the homemaker. So mm-hmm. what do you do then? Well, you what Christians need to do is is um, respond with what the biblical model is. And Proverbs thirty one is the place you go. You say, my goodness. And then if you look at that lady in Proverbs thirty one. Uh, this is a remarkable woman. Um, this is not just a woman who knows how to bake bread. She knows how to do that. Um, and she does that. And in addition to all of those things, her home is this place of um, a flurry of activity and work that is productive to the members of her household and um, and, and thereby productive um to the society at large, understanding um, what's going on with the market and buying and selling. She considers a field, she buys it. She produces all kinds of things for her household. Uh, She's not afraid of the future. You could go on and on about what this lady's doing and it's far more glorious um, than just um, the idea that I need a career. And and that's really Mm -hmm. the way I'm going to, to advance. So tying in dominion, to what's going on in the very marriage union. Um, what happens at the first marriage? Well, Christ, it, it was in Adam's work. It was when Adam was working that um, we have in scripture, it's not good for man to be alone. Mm-hmm. So your picture of it's not good for man to be alone is not just man standing in a solitary room somewhere and you look at him and you go, well, that's not, that's not, that's not it. We need a, we, it's not good for him <laughs> to be by himself. That's not the picture. It's the, it's the guy he's trying to work. He's trying to cultivate a field. He's trying to take care mm-hmm. of, he's trying to try and take care of a garden. And it's like, no, no, this isn't working. We need a helper suitable to him. We need someone who's mm-hmm. actually going to help him in his work. Um, now that woman, you does, do you see, this is what marriage is really about. You are, you are going to help this man in his work and thereby you are, you are one with him. You are his body. You're working together. You're laboring together in this field. So the things that you're doing, in the home, the homemaking, which is a clear biblical duty and responsibility for wives, um, is is organically connected, and she sees it as connected. Yes, it's distinct. Um, he's doing he's doing something, and you're doing something. But you have been joined, uh, just as a man and a woman are distinct. Even a husband and a wife are distinct, but they have been joined. This is the glorious work of God, and 
she begins to think of her work that way. And he begins to think of her work that way where she's enriching. Mm -hmm. him. Um, and the, and the feminist would say, yeah, that's the thing that we don't like. We don't like that she enriches. Him. <laughs> right. And you're like, yeah, but the reason you don't like that is because you don't believe that she's his body. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because if you believe that she's his body, when she enriches him, she enriches herself. This, mm -hmm. this, your your crazy radical individualism is tied into all that's why you're such a grumpy muffin and where this other lady <laughs> this biblical christian lady, is like that. I mean, happy to enrich her husband because he's like we're winning and our children are winning mm -hmm. and our coming children and the coming generations are winning she understands that this is a team thing that we really are one um so that's the way that's a little bit of how i think you have to approach this um this fractured uh, way that evangelicals are living. When you find uh, women and men that are thinking the way you just described, you basically see they have bought in to the goalposts of the modern zeitgeist. Mm. And you, you can't ministers, teachers, Christ, other Christians who want to help them can't say, well, yeah, the modern zeitgeist got the goalpost right, but, the Bible says we have to do this. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 no. They, it's like dumb. What they're, what they're doing is really, really dumb. And what yeah. God's supposed to do is, is glorious and wise and fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes, I guess, with just again, an overall fully biblical worldview, which goes back to, I mean, even having an understanding, a biblical understanding of an actual creation recently with actual Adam and Eve, actual global flood and actual judgment, actual sin and all these things that go along with that, that so often you'll see people who affirm the alphabet soup, the, well, you know, maybe she has the right to kill her baby sometimes. And, you know, these types of things, maybe you should sleep together first or live together first before you get married. And yeah, you know, but I'm a still Christian. I'm still a Christian. You know, I still love Jesus. I love the Bible, blah, blah, blah. But there, then you ask them about these other just, basic doctrinal things that no one really questioned for literally thousands of years until, you know, 17, 1800s uh, and rise of, of course, uh, the Enlightenment and, and uh, Darwin and even Darwin's grandfather and guys like that beforehand of this, this, well, let's, let's have an alternative worldview. Maybe this all blew up. Maybe there's materialistic evolution that actually created everything. And then some Christians want to marry that and think, well, I still love the Bible. I still love Jesus maybe we'll just be theistic evolutionists. Maybe we'll be like, you know, there's a day, there's a gap, there's a this, there's a this. And you're like, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. You're, you're still trying to do this oil and water mentality of blending these two things. And it ain't going to work. It's just right. not going to work. And people get this with, and then it works out in their education. It works out in uh, their life, how they spend their money. And certainly with how they raise their children, uh, marriage, family, mm -hmm. even how they vote you know, the, the self-government and then this slow, small, well, not slow, but small um, entity of husband, wife, and then children and then church community or neighbors and then kind of this outward versus, hey, I think the state should handle this. I, yeah, that makes sense. That guy's going to promise stuff. We'll just vote for him, you know, and it's like, I don't, uh, anyway, it's. Yeah, and the uh, the materialist worldview that you were just talking about is um, is just right. And it's applied, uh, that same worldview is bought into by conservatives who want to buy into the hierarchical design of marriage. So yeah. they, they, they say, well, the Bible says that I'm the head, you know, wives submit to your husbands, children obey your parents and the Lord. So I've got my umbrella gone. And, but what happens is those people have bought into the materialist worldview that this is just a mm -hmm. structure, but there's no life giving heavenly uh, empowered, um, spirit blessed kind of operation of that system. Okay. So that's where you get these weird corruptions where, and they, they don't look compelling to the world. Uh, they look dry and dusty. Uh, you got the right, you got the right structure maybe, but it's not, um, if, if it's not blessed by the Lord, if it's not empowered by his spirit, then it's going to be in the flesh and it's going to be corrupt. And um, this is where I think pastor Doug has a really good, line in one of his books maybe it's federal husband and he says you know there's a there's a modern even i don't know what he calls it basically a non-covenantal way of of 
of living. And he says it's characterized by, say, pornography. One of the kids, one of the boys starts looking at pornography. And the parents are shocked, um, offended. And then they say, you know, I can't believe he's doing this. We didn't raise him this way. We didn't raise right. him this way. And that's the sin. That's the that's the thing, right? Like I, I had my structure. I knew that I was the husband was the head, and the wife submitted her, her husband, and the children were taught to obey their parents. I didn't teach them this way. But he says the covenantal approach is same situation. Son's looking at pornography. It comes to it comes to the surface, and the father goes into his prayer closet and says, "Father, pornography has taken uh, um, uh, a foothold in this household. Please drive it out." this is a man that is actually, see, he's not a materialist. It's not just about the X's and O's. I, I got the, you know, I did everything I was supposed to do and I'm supposed to get this right. outcome. Very machine-like, right? Very, very Darwin. Mm -hmm. I, I did A, yeah. B is supposed to happen. The other mindset is no, there's a living God and this is a household and God deals with our household through the head. Um, he deals with the individuals in the household as individuals. We don't deny that, mm -hmm. but there's also like a, I want to speak with um, the longshores, okay? And then there's someone there. The same way with nations, right? There's this. There's the headship has some kind of, the headship has some kind of relationship to the heavenlies, to God. It's mm -hmm. not just this materialistic structure that has fallen out of the sky and plopped down without a purpose, um, and without without an operating system um, that. Um, it, it, let's put it this way: the operating system is actually connected to heaven. It's, it's not just uh, an, an earthly kind of thing that's going on that I that's really what I think we if I'm when I'm pressing on this issue um, that we're discussing, I want to hit there. I want to hit especially these conservatives that have the structure. They have the form of godliness, but deny its power. They have that. Why well, have my system? I'm a good I'm a good. Uh, I understand Ephesians five. I've read it. Yeah. But like, are you doing it by the spirit? Um, that's the question. Mm. No, that's good. I like that. Um, back to the, I just want to comment for the first and second wave feminists, um, even with, you know, women get the right to vote, which we won't get into uh, really. But one thing that was the counter to that, because of course you think like, well, they're citizens, of course they deserve the right to vote. It's like, well, the structure is getting married. We are living a very perverse time where, you know, you may get married, you may not, you may sleep around, you may not, you may whatever, maybe you'll be a lesbian, I don't know. Like, it, it, it's just like, there's all these options as the secular ad attitude, right? Whereas even, I, and I would say arguing that I would say marriage is for everybody, even if you're not a Christian, because God designed it uh, as such, but, which we could probably get into and whatever. But the point is like the wife and the husband, if they're one flesh and say the man's the only one who gets to vote for example say it's you know 1913 or whatever well do you think his wife if they're in a good relationship do you think she's not going to have something to say about it do you think you know the head the husband's the head but the wife's the neck that kind of mentality of course that's not scriptural but in a good healthy relationship you both talk you confess your sin to each other you you do things for each other she's your closest neighbor he's your closest neighbor you're loving them matthew 7 golden rule the whole thing but people have such a perverse and they think men are automatically abusers like white people automatically racist that's the new one right men are obviously bad they're taller they're bigger they're stronger they've got all the power they're obviously bad oh we have to undo all that and i think that's kind of been the the default correct me if i'm wrong but i think that's the default that a lot of people have had even in the church for the better part of 100 years um and then secondly even with the second wave feminists people have this idea that yeah we need to work you're right we got the right to vote now we need to work and it's like well, did you not think that the government's pushing you so that they get twice as much tax <laughs> and get you out of your home so then they can catechize and teach your children and do all these things that uh, you weren't now doing? I mean, it's 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 that those are two different sides to the argument that I learned fairly recently. I think it's uh, one of those books. The um, canon has it. The masculine husband. I don't know. It's a blue cover. I can't remember. Um, masculine Christianity, maybe. Mm, yes, masculine Christianity. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, those were two. And I've heard those arguments before, but it was something that really crossed my mind to think, oh, yeah, you turn that turn that over and look at it from a different angle. And it's not just about, quote unquote, equal rights. It's, well, you still have a vote. 
you know, if you're in a good relationship with your husband, you know, you're getting married at a normal quote unquote age of 18, 20, 22. Well, that's when you're going to start voting anyway. I mean, my wife and I talk all the time and we, even if she couldn't vote, we'd still vote the same way. So, okay, two versus one, but we're pretty much voting 99% of the same time anyway. Uh, anyway, that's kind of a little different angle, I guess you could say, but, um, why then, I guess, what's the remedy? And we, we can kind of wrap up with this and you can talk a little bit more about your book. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago, or we've said it maybe a couple times, building, um, what does that mean? Exactly. Kind of flesh that out again. Some people are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They got a lot of debt, student debt. You know, you can't just, the wife can't just up and quit her job. She's a nurse. She's a teacher. She's working towards these things. I mean, I know several people that would much rather not be working. Uh, and sometimes they work part-time or, you know, they'll work a 24 hour shift or something like that. Uh, but you know, again, the dollar is garbage, although <laughs> That coincides with women going into the workforce, which is interesting, um, and and overspending and taking off the gold standard and Nixon and all this other stuff. But what what's the remedy, Jared? What 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 should families do um, to take you know the next three to five steps of like we need something different? What do you got? Yeah. Um, well, they need to know what kind of institution that they find themselves in. They need to know what the marriage institution is. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand somebody might say, well, we know what it is, man. But <clears throat> I don't I don't think that many people do it. it that's it's going to start with the truth of what kind of what a family is. Mm -hmm. I, and, and you got to realize how crazy our times are. In my book, I opened up with the a case called Pavin v. Smith, which was a Supreme Court case that came um, up out of Arkansas. It's really fascinating. There's, uh, it's post Obergefell, so Obergefell says that a man can marry a man and have all the rights of marriage. A woman can marry a woman and have all the rights of marriage. Well, one of the rights of marriage is being a parent. Mm -hmm. They got big problems there. So in in Arkansas, there were uh, two two women in a lesbian relationship. One of them was artificially inseminated with a random man semen and had a child. Arkansas said, well, the one that's having the child, you can be listed as a parent, but the lesbian partner can't be listed as a parent on the birth certificate. Mm. But she wanted to be. Um, now the problem was Arkansas had a standard that said, if this was a male and female married, and the female was artificially inseminated by a random man semen, then she'd be the mother and her husband would be the father. Hmm, interesting. Since they already had that standard, a Burgerfell says, if you do it for one, you got to do it for the other. So the Supreme court said, Arkansas, you got to acknowledge that this lady is a parent of the hmm. child. What you say, what kind of world are you living in? So you're living in a world <laughs> where a woman who has no biological relationship to that child and no genuine marriage covenant relationship to the child, right. Can become a mother, can become a mother hmm. because she wants to. And what's creepy is like, that's the way that Americans have thought for a long time. It's now in the standard. It's now in the civil, civil law, but We've been thinking that way, like children are commodities that we'll have if we want to. Uh, a wife is some is is an accessory that I'll have if I want to. A uh, husband is an accessory that I'll have if I want to, and maybe I won't even get him. And I'll try to adopt child children, or I'll go artificial reproductive technologies and get one. I'll get my I'll get my accessory. Um, we we treated children like commodities and we treated um, marriage as an optional kind of, of thing. Um, and that's a, that's a messed up mindset. That's like a weird messed up way of thinking that we've been infected with. Um, the truth is God is the one who joins man and woman together. And God is the one who opens and closes the womb and your children are a heritage from the Lord and they belong to you because God himself has given them to you. So there is this, you have to step back from all of the 
kind of practical cultural war, warrior moment and realize what team you're on and, and what your team is about. Mm-hmm. It's about a God in heaven who by divine action has created this family, this unit. This is what we are. And he's designed it in a certain way um, with various duties and responsibilities of all the parties involved. But we are not a bunch of individuals um, that have been kind of thrown into a bowl together with certain mm-hmm. duties and responsibilities. We are an organic thing that God himself has has, has created with responsibilities first Godward um, and flowing from that to each other and flowing that from that to our community. You're going to have to deal with that because as you start to deal with that, you're going to start to see the kind of um, repentance that you need as a family. Mm. And then you're going to start to live and operate in such a way with the kind of fruit that comes with, with wisdom that will eradicate something like Pavin V. Smith from happening in the future. will undo the, the legal trouble and the culture problems that we're having. But it's going to start with you realizing how radically different um, you, you're thinking about life itself, the world itself, your marriage itself. This is what I call the covenant solution to the dissolving American family. The, this is what my book was about saying. This is really, look how far we've fallen. It's mm-hmm. creeping and wild. And it actually is going to go back to saying, what is a marriage? This is where we would say um, gay marriage is no thing. It's not, it's not a thing. Those men are not actually bound because mm-hmm. God either joins together or he doesn't join together. And just because you stand up and go through the motions, two, two men go and vow. They can vow um, love until death all they want. Yeah, and you can hire some weird priestess to say that, you know, this is this is this is the real deal. But it's it's not the real deal, which helps you to see what your marriage is. Mm-hmm. It's real. It, it's a real thing. And when the children come, they're really a part of the thing. That's why they have your last name. That's why the wife takes the last name. That's why at a traditional marriage, uh, the minister announces, um, I, "I present to you for the very first time, Mister and Mrs." jared longshore mm-hmm. and you know, the, the what, where's what about her and the christian says well she was you didn't hear didn't you hear she was included yeah yeah this she's his body this is this is what just happened right um and then the children come and they have whose last name they have the last name and, and why well because this is a real one thing that God himself has created. Mm-hmm. You've got to start there because that's the, the um, because then you have a family that's actually not going to be um, broken apart and dissolved. Um, you probably have heard the line from, um, I think it's Michelle Millet, uh, the radical feminist. I think she, I think it's Michelle Millet who was the radical feminist and her sister told a story about in the like 1960s. I think they were in New York. There was this call and response and they said, why, what are we here to do today? And they said, cultural revolution. How do we make the cultural revolution by destroying the American family mm. and how do we destroy the American family by promoting promiscuity, destroying monogamy, we'll, we'll, we'll destroy the marriage union and therefore we'll destroy the family. And once we've destroyed the family, we can get the cultural revolution that we want. Mm. The reason they wanted to destroy the family was very tactical, very strategic. You can't manipulate that family, um, but we'll, we'll destroy it. And then we can manipulate a bunch of individuals. We can, we can, we can do that. Right. So what I'm telling you is I'm going back to this like divine action that constitutes a family. When you understand covenant marriage and the covenant family, that's one that won't be that can't be broken to pieces, to shreds. And if you actually think and operate that way, then you're not going to do the kinds of actions you're talking about that do dissolve the family. The, the, the things that you're lamenting are downstream actions of a family that has already forsaken the covenant idea mm. that is that has already said. We're just individuals that have voluntarily agreed to be together. Um, so my our marriage and our even our family now, our, cho- our choice of spouse and our choice of children, it's all voluntary associations. This is just a voluntary yeah. association. Um, it exists because I, it exists because I announced something uh, rather than God himself did something. So that's where you need to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Recently, and I've seen it a couple times, uh, the replacement for Rick Warren, I forget his name, uh, the guy, pastor, new pastor, uh, thing popped up a couple years ago about 
him and his wife, they were doing like a Q and a, you know, kind of live stream type thing like we're doing here. And it was about, uh, two dudes. It was a question, two dudes. Oh, they love Jesus. Um, and they're married. What should they do? Blah, blah, blah. And this guy and his wife were both stumped. I mean, it was just like, well, you know, God hates divorce. And of course I have a reaction uh, immediately. What's your reaction <laughs> when someone says, Hey, Pastor Longshore, uh, I just want to let you know, you know, me and my, my gay lover were, were, were married. I married a couple years ago, but I, 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 I love Christ, I think, and, and sin. And I feel guilty in this and this and this, but I, I can be married though. I mean, divorce is a bad thing, right? What would you say to that person? Yeah. Well, first I'd say, well, praise the Lord that this guy you're talking to is under conviction and praise the Lord that he's asking about pastor about what, you know, what to do that's right. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's good. And um, the truth for him is to say, um, you're not really married to that man. You're not really married. So, yeah. um, and, and this is what it, which means is, there's no actual divorce then. Right. Right. There's no, there's no divorce. There's no marriage. And, but, and, <clears throat> This is the uh, mo modern Christians coming to discover the world that we live in. We live in a supernatural world mm -hmm. where God actually joins people together or he does not. So the reason you're under this conviction is because you're um, you're pretending, you know, you're doing like a LARPing kind of thing here. You're in a cosplay situation and you need to get out of it um, um, and you need to actually live live the real deal. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of a straightforward situation that just needs to be dealt with with pastoral sensitivity and firmness and say look this is this is the situation um this isn't a real marriage doesn't yeah. need a real doesn't need a real divorce right yeah okay no that's what that's what i said too <laughs> uh but no it's good to, it's not looking for justification necessarily but it's nice to hear that because uh i think a lot of christians like you said we people are waking up i think to a degree and thinking wait a second yeah, that's it. Well, God hates divorce. Da, da, da. And you're like, but he also hates gay marriage because it's not marriage. Like, like, he also hates sin. He also hates sexual immorality, all these other things. Uh, and so where like, where, where do we draw this line of like dis disgust and hatred for sin and, and so on? Um, Yeah, no, this was good. There's probably lots and lots more we could discuss. Do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, any suggestion on talk a little bit more about your book you want to pitch that there at canon press i know you uh it's on uh is it on sure, the app yeah. as well could you listen to it audio as well um it is coming out on the app so okay. yeah i might pitch that to you and i've actually got a bug out myself so i'll give you kind of like a last little um pitch here but um yes my book um the case for the christian family subtitle um the covenant solution to the dissolving american family it is available at canon press um and it's not a terribly long book, um, so it's kind of a sh it's a short read. But I do pack some some there's some there's a lot of there's a lot of Bible verses and uh, a little bit of theology that goes into it. But I think it's mm -hmm. it's getting at this what we've talked about in this particular podcast, and it should be available on the Canon uh, Plus app very soon. So there'll be an audio version of that coming out as well. And then I've also got a project that's going up on the Canon Plus app um, that will, I think it's going to be called The Case for the Christian Family, where I sit down and do some interviews with Pastor Doug Wilson, Pastor Toby Sumter, um, and several others out here. Dr. Ben Merkel, president of New St. Andrews College, um, and some other friends. And we talk about the, uh, kind of the same same stuff we've been working over here in, in a little bit more detail. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, well, I appreciate it, brother. I really do. Once again, uh, where, if somebody wants to ask you a question or reach out to you, shoot you an email, what's the best way to, uh, to connect with you? Um, well, I'm on all the, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and you can, you can, um, I, I write a blog at Jared R And I think okay. there's a, there's a contact link there too. So if you wanted to shoot me a note, you could do it that way. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Check out that book. I have yet to read it. Uh, I look forward to either the audio or, or the actual paperback. Um, sounds good. It's something that we need, I think, and we need it far more than we realize, even if we're Christians, yeah, Ephesians 5, even if, our, even if our wife stays home, my home's are all kids, all this stuff, there's still so much assumption and so many kind of, I want to say, holes in our theology, right? And then we just 
you come to that and you think, uh oh, what about this? What about that? Because the world's fallen and increasingly we're seeing the wretched fallenness of it, the sinfulness of sin and all all the things that come along with that. So again, I appreciate the time and uh, yeah, that's it. Everybody have a good day and we'll see you next time. <laughs>